It's Tuesday, September the 27th, 2022. This is Wes Fryer broadcasting, or narrowcasting, I guess, for my Class with Dr. Fryer channel. And I have just been to my first amateur radio meeting, ham radio meeting, uh, of a local Charlotte, North Carolina-based club. And I want to share some of what I experienced and learned. I probably have not... I don't think I've ever been to a meeting where I have felt quite as ignorant, um, but it wasn't terrible. Um, but like a whole lot of what was said at this meeting and talked about just, you know, went basically completely over my head. Um, so what I think I'm going to talk about is I'll tell just really briefly, um, well, first off, how you can get to the links and stuff like that that I'm going to mention if you're interested in ham radio. I'm going to talk first about why I'm interested in this, why I went to this at all, and why I want to become a ham and get my amateur radio uh, license to operate uh, a ham radio. Then I'll talk about some of the links and the things that I've learned, um, and then I'll finish because I actually have a bunch of student assignments to still grade for tomorrow, and I've got my lessons to do, um, which is not going to take that long, but anyway... I've got some stuff to do, but I want to share this. So this is why I'm actually recording it on Anchor, because Anchor is so easy to record and publish and share. So for context, for folks who may not have any idea, I'm Wes Fryer. I'm a middle school um, media literacy and computer science teacher. I teach 6th, 7th, and 8th graders now um, down in Charlotte at Providence Day School. And I teach a couple sections of robotics and a couple sections of computer applications this year. And our family just moved two months ago to the Charlotte area. And it is an absolutely lovely evening tonight. I'm sitting out in my backyard and it is, well, I can't see the exact temperature because my watch is, the nine is right over uh, my temperature. Um, I'm going to bet it's in the 60s and... I'm going to waste time here figuring this out. So, it's 63 degrees right now. So, anyway, it has just been in such a spectacular week of weather. We're about to get hit with Hurricane Ian's rain on probably Thursday night and like all day Friday and Saturday, which was kind of interesting actually coming to this meeting because hams or, you know, amateur radio enthusiasts are the are some of the people that you want to know in an emergency because they have the ability to communicate to both share information and get information uh, even when like electrical grids are down and the internet could be even be down it's it, it's kind of amazing uh, and so anyway we don't I don't anticipate <laughs> that we're going to have you know catastrophic effects but some of the forecasts are talking about you know four to seven inches of rain possibly falling um, in our area you know, possibly this weekend. That's a lot of rain. So anyway, that was just kind of interesting because as I'm going to talk about this, uh, Hurricane Weather Network is actually up and functioning right now. And when I was driving home today, it's about 30 minutes to get to this uh, meeting location, uh, I saw probably a caravan of about 20 different electrical trucks that were like snorkel trucks, and I'm sure that they were just headed south, you know, to Florida and to, to other areas that are probably going to have losses of power. So let's talk about why I even went and why am I interested in this at all. Um, first off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post this to my blog with the reference links that I'm sharing here. And I'm going to use my URL shortener to um, create this shortened link. So if you want to go to wfryer.me slash ham1. So that's w-f-r-y-e-r dot me slash h-a-m-1. Since this was my first ham meeting. Uh, that's what I'm gonna. That, that's what I'll link um, my blog to. Or I'll I'll have that you that shortened link point to my blog post. Um, I've become convinced I want to become a prepper, basically, and that may sound like radical and crazy. And I don't want to be radical and crazy. But what I do want to do is take reasonable preparations, make some reasonable preparations for different kinds of emergencies that could happen. And there's a there's a lot of different reasons for this. Um, but one of them is the realization that, like, civilization is pretty fragile, actually. And I think COVID has probably enhanced our awareness of that as far as supply chains, 
Um, you know, Hurricane Katrina is, was something that happened a number of years ago that I wasn't directly involved in, but I knew people who were involved. And I heard stories. And I mean, there is a war going on in the Ukraine right now. I was just listening to a podcast today um, by a former CIA agent. It's uh, Ezra Klein's podcast. I'll, I'll link it. It's excellent. But you know, we just have no idea what's going to happen in terms of global geopolitics and a whole lot of things. And so, you know, hopefully we're not going to have an interruption in in the, the power grid and the electrical system. Hopefully we're not going to have an interruption in, you know, supplies that are that are being brought to us. And, you know, anyway, there, we, we hope that there, these things are not going to happen. But FEMA, our federal emergency, um, what does FEMA stand for? It's the Federal Preparedness, Emergency Preparedness Organization. You know, they've got recommendations for everybody. And they say things like, have, you know, several days of water, or have some food at your house, you know, have supplies, have flashlights with charged batteries. And, you know, there's a number of things that if something happens, it's good to be able to be holed up at your house and be okay. You know, have the water and food and toilet paper and resources and things that you need. Um you know, um, an Eagle Scout, I was a Boy Scout, I was a survival instructor when I was at the Air Force Academy. I've done different things with the outdoors and emergency preparedness and wilderness survival and things like that. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of into that. I, I think that stuff's cool. And I'm actually, now that we've moved to North Carolina, I've, I don't know, I've had a chance to think about and evaluate the kinds of activities and hobbies and things like that that I'm doing and I've just I've decided that that emergency preparedness and home security um, and you know just trying to do the best I can to provide for the safety of my family is a priority for me and it's something I want to do that's fun but it also is very practical as well because these may be preparations and things that we end up using and the aha that I maybe had more this summer than, than I'd had before was that part of the reason I want to be well prepared for some kind of an emergency is not only to take care of our family, but to be able to help our community, to be able to help our neighbors, to be able to help folks in our church, or maybe even people we don't know, but people who are going to need help and assistance. And so anyway, in this whole mix of, ooh, how might you prepare for some kind of an emergency? Emergency communications are part of that. My dog's out here barking. Rosie, come here. We got a fence put in last week. Our dogs have been on tethers for, mm, I guess, about, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe since we moved. We stayed in an Airbnb for about three weeks, and uh, it was this really cool, like, old farmhouse. And uh, the dogs got to run around a little bit without being tethered. But anyway, they're experiencing the novel freedom of having a large yard and being able to run around all over the place. But they're barking a little more than we'd like, and they are certainly rolling in the dirt a lot more than we would like. But I digress. All right. So that's just a little bit about why I got involved. Let me also <coughs> reference, guys, no barking. No. I'm going to have to put them in if they're barking. No. Isn't this lovely? Here's the wonder of the unedited podcast. You're just going to get everything, unless something disastrous happens, <laughs> you're going to get everything here without an edit. Um, I was able about two weeks ago to have a lovely conversation over video uh, with my friend Carol Ann McGuire, who is an educator, now librarian in Southern California. And Carol Ann is a friend that I know through the ADE, Apple Distinguished Educator program. And we've uh, had a chance to actually get to know each other better through a wonderful, wonderful summer program that a mutual friend who's also an ADE had put together um, at uh, his family's, I guess it's like, it's kind of a ranch and not really an Airbnb, but anyway, just a, a lovely place in East Texas. Anyway, Carol and I talked about ham radio for about an hour because she decided to get her ham radio license and become a ham a few years back. And she knew, knows more than I did and do. And I wanted to talk to her and pick her brain. Um, I still need to find out exactly like what radio she has and, you know, some of the details as far as equipment. But anyway, I will link that as well if you want to check that out. So today I went to the Charlotte Ham Radio meeting 
for the club whose web address is w4bfb.org and that stands for well and it's and mars which is the mecklenburg amateur radio society they are an affiliate club of the official american radio relay league which is a a r l and a r r l is the website and that's the group i'm going to join here soon that has tons of stuff to uh, help you study and prepare for the examinations there are three different levels of exams that you can have to become an amateur radio to obtain your your amateur radio license and so anyway they have monthly meetings except for i think in december and uh they have different programs and things and tonight was like an ice cream social but they had people who brought different kinds of equipment go kits and um different rigs that they are and things that they wanted to sell so there was a guy selling an oscilloscope which i guess you have when you're going to be you know trying to repair a radio and determining what you know frequencies and um signals that it is able to both send and and receive and you got to make the you know the radio signals uh visible or an electricity visible so use an oscilloscope to do that Anyway, he was selling an analog one. He had upgraded to a digital one. Um, so that was our program. I ended up meeting a real nice guy named Ron. One of the things that's interesting about hams is like in, in this world where sometimes people are really like protective of their name and identifying information, like every ham wants you to know their name and their call sign. So, of course, I don't know if it's of a course, but... I think there was one woman there. I didn't actually really count the crowd. There were probably about 30 people at the meeting, 20 to 30 people. And uh, most of them were older, gray-headed white males that um, had on either a hat with their uh, name and their, and their call sign. And it's not their call sign, I guess. That's like a flying thing. Their, their uh, radio handle. I don't even know what the right way to say that is. Um, or, or a shirt, you know, that has their name on it, uh, with their, with their, um, call, I'm going to try to just call it a call sign. And so anyway, be, that's their identifier that you're going to use, uh, for your, um, your, you know, conversations that you're having. Um, they sponsor the Charlotte Ham Fest that there's actually supposed to be one that happening in Fort Mill, which is just south of us this weekend on October 1st, but because we're supposed to get tons of rain, they are postponing that one. But the Charlotte Ham Fest, you can find it, charlottehamfest.org, uh, happens in March each year. It's going to be the weekend of March 11th and 12th. Uh, there's a lot of things that this uh, ham radio club does besides monthly meetings. They support different events, and because of the you know, knowledge and capabilities that they have, um, my guess and my understanding is that when they support different events, um, they're providing emergency communications for these different events. And so they have different folks that are needed. They talked about sag wagons and, you know, people, I guess, that are, you know, in vehicles, uh, supporting different events and, and I guess just providing emergency communication for them, mobile emergency communication. Um, they also have something called Winter Field Day. I guess they do one of these perhaps in the spring. Uh, they do it the last full weekend of January. And so the, I'll, I'll, of course, share all these links, but winterfieldday.com. Um, and I'll just read the first little section here. Winter Field Day is a communications exercise. WFD is held the last full weekend in January. WFD can be worked from the comfort of your home or in a remote location. You can participate by yourself or get your friends, family, or whole club involved. Winter Field Day is open to participants worldwide. Amateur radio operators may use frequencies on the HF, VHF, or UHF bands and are free to use any mode that can faithfully transmit the required exchange intact. Similar to the ARRL's field day, bonus points are earned in several ways, including using non-commercial power sources, operating from remote locations, satellite contacts, and more. Winter Field Day is sponsored by the Winter Field Day Association. We passionately believe that ham radio operators should practice portable emergency communications in winter environments as the potential for freezing temperatures, snow, ice, and other hazards present unique operational concerns. And so, anyway, this is, this is an example of some of the stuff that, that hams do, you know. Hams talk on their radios, but they don't just talk. There's other, other ways of communicating that I'll tell you about a little bit that I, that I learned about tonight. 
Um, but they practice, you know, they check in, um, and uh, they're ready to respond. They're, they're ready to support, ready to report weather conditions, ready to, to do all kinds of things if needed. And it's this whole network of folks that are all over the globe that are ready to assist and help their communities if needed in an emergency. One of the things that I didn't mention in terms of my interest in ham radio, my grandfather on my mother's side, Richard Dean Henley, was a ham. In fact, we have a couple of his ham radio microphones that we've just kind of kept and my wife has taken to class and they're just sort of like, you know, they're, they're not functional now. We don't have them plugged in. Uh, the cords are actually cut, uh, but they're cool. They're really cool microphones. And uh, as we've done podcasting and sort of radio recording and stuff like that you know excuse me in our classrooms have been something that you know I've, my wife more than more than myself have um have done I, I don't know we've we've kept them anyway we've they're a symbol and so it's like cool to connect to this like family history i think in terms of getting into ham radio and becoming a ham there's that like side of it um, another link that I learned about is called Ham Club Online. So this is software that the uh, ham community uses, amateur radio club management system. And so I guess if I will join the club, which I think I have to probably get my license to join the club. I don't know. But um, anyway, at whatever point I can, I'm going to join this, this club. And I think that's like the software that does a listserv and things like that to be able to, to communicate. Okay, so let me tell you some things that Ron taught me. Uh, first of all, one of the things that they talked about at the meeting, and I had no idea what they were talking about, they talked about repeaters and packet, and there's these frequencies that, that they're listing. So repeaters, from what I understand, are basically towers that you connect to with a lower powered ham radio, and these can be like $50 handheld battery operated sets, or they can be like massive $10,000 plus you know, base stations that you have with like huge antennas at your house. Um, but when you connect to a repeater, then that can connect you to the wider world. And we have three different repeaters here in the Charlotte area. And for about six hours, uh, and I think it was, I, think, I don't know if this is like once a week. Anyway, I didn't take a note, notes about this. But I think it is. I think it might be, excuse me, like on Sunday night. Um, they're all connected. So wherever you are in the Charlotte area, you know, it's like a hub that you're all connected. And so people will check in. Um, and then and be able to connect. Now, packet, which I had no clue what that is, is a way that you can connect to the internet via ham radio. And so that is part of what this uh, wonderful, nice man, Ron, showed me tonight was his computer setup. He had a battery, uh, it wasn't a Jackery. Um, I think I took a picture of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll post links to some of the pictures I took of some of the, the gear that excuse me, that the hams had tonight. But he had a Windows-based computer that was connected to his radio, or his, I guess, a transceiver. And then it could connect like a modem, okay, back in the day. <laughs> Those of us that are old that, you know, in my case, you know, started connecting to the, to the Internet. Well, really, but really when I was at the Air Force Academy from 88 to 92, uh, we had a very early version of, of an intranet where we were, you know, sending um, messages, you know, uh, uh, within the wing. But it was in the the early 90s and then the mid 90s that, you know, the internet really exploded and took off. And so um, this is this is a very, very short and, sh and slow way of connecting with ham radio. But what's so cool is you can do packet without... It, like the internet being up in and, and you know through internet service providers using the the regular DNS you know d domain name uh, service that that resolves domain names and IPs. So as an example, uh, there is something called the uh, Hurricane Watch Network. So hwn.org and it is active right now and you can have these different frequencies and people are going to rotate and part of what they'll do is they're going to be reporting on conditions and stuff like that and then helping uh, i guess transmit information um as the as different hurricanes are um you know affecting different areas 
And so, anyway, you can tune in to the Hurricane Watch ne Network. It says, Amateur Radio, serving the National Hurricane Center and mankind since 1965. Um, so that's an example of, of, again, some things that hams do. Okay, in addition to learning just a tiny bit about Packet and how it works, and the system that Ron uses is called WinLink. And it's Windows-based software, and there's, it's cool. There's all these different templates that format the text messages. Now, um, there's all these different protocols that you can connect to Packet with, I guess. And WinLink is one of those. There's another one, and I think he said a radio astronomer came up with this, and it's called FT8. And it only transmits 13 characters at a time. But, of course, those can be strung together. And uh, there was another uh, protocol called JS8, he said, that was built on top of it. Anyway, these are messaging uh, protocols that allow for really low-power communications. But one of the things that people have done with this... And it's with packet, but I think with FT8 maybe as well, is like folks that are on sailboats and they're like by themselves or with, you know, small parties or whatever, not big old ships. Um, they have used this as a way to be able to send like an SOS, emergency messages. Um, and they've been able to, to, you know, connect to other radios that wait for these tones. And then when these tones come on, you know, then they're ready to, you know, share these signals. So... There's a whole bunch of apps. I took a picture of Ron's phone um, with a bunch of, of ham apps. Like the ones that are definitely like connecting letting you broadcast, you have to have your license in order to use. Uh, but there's one called App Scanner Radio that shows you uh, different frequencies and things like that that you can turn into. And um, anyway, that's probably about all that I learned tonight. But like I said at the beginning, I don't know that I've ever gone to a meeting where I felt more ignorant. I mean, when I took all these different kinds of engineering at the Air Force Academy, aeronautical, astronautical, civil, mechanical, design. I don't know. I was a fuzzy major and majored in political science and geography. So I took the fuzzy versions of those courses. There's definitely a lot of lingo and jargon, um, electrical engineering. I mean, there's all this stuff. I've took, taken classes in, in some of these things, and I, I actually got decent grades in some of them as well. But I didn't really emerge with a super functional skill set, you know, in terms of like building circuits or really even understanding many fundamentals of how electricity works. Like, moose, no, no, sir. Um, like, I, I would not be able to safely get a, uh, a, a tester, you know, and be able to you know, test for electrical current and stuff like that. Like, I don't, I don't understand electricity that well. But that is another point of interest in all of this, too, is like solar power and, you know, how, how solar panels work and how we could use those when we go camping, how we might end up, you know, someday having solar power at our house. We've got so many trees around our house right now in North Carolina that the little solar lights that I put in our front, you know, basically don't, they don't get a whole days they don't get a whole night's charge because there's just there's too many shadows there's not enough sunlight but anyway that stuff is is, is interesting and there's it's so it's so deep and one of the things when I came home tonight that my wife said so I, I said something about you know wow I've never felt so ignorant before in my life and she said it was a steep learning curve it's like yes <laughs> Yes, there is, you know, because like the expert level, which I don't remember, I think the lowest, there's three levels of licensing and the early, the first one's like technician, but the, the top level is, um, I mean, there's a lot of physics, but that's something else that appeals to me. I enjoyed learning about physics and I do now. Hey, I watch Nova specials. Um, and there's a lot of things that I enjoy sharing with my students and having insights into and so anyway, I just think that learning more about ham radio, getting my license, all this is going to be a fun journey. It's going to be challenging. And like there's, and I've, I've faced this with the world of technology and, you know, internet connectivity and using 
using apps and using websites to you know publish information to create video to create multimedia I, I love all that stuff but when it comes to like website hosting I mean I reach my my geek quotient I don't know if that's the right way to say that but I I reach that where I'm like okay this is I'm at my limit here and sometimes that's happened like when my websites have been hacked um, I still host about 30 different WordPress websites uh, which have to be maintained, which have to be updated, and which from time to time have even gotten hacked, and I've had to restore them from backup, you know, or in some cases, I mean, I've started over. I, I actually just did that with our Story Chaser site um, and just, just built it from scratch, you know, in, in a Google site instead of a WordPress site. Anyway, with probably just every technical field imaginable, you know, there's going to be some kind of upper limit to, like, where either you, you can't pierce further into the into that genre or you don't want to and so I don't know exactly where that limit is here um, I'm gonna have to learn a lot more than I know now I think about the electromagnetic spectrum about radio about electricity about a lot of that stuff and I think that's gonna be cool but you know I'm, <laughs> I'm already aware I think like I'm not I don't think I want to buy an oscilloscope like if if you hear me in a couple years talking about having bought an oscilloscope and using it I mean that's going to be a real surprise because I'm not thinking that that particular piece of equipment and that kind of a skill set is something that I want to do. But I think it'll be cool to be able to know how to use ham radio, operate on the ham radio network, maybe help you know volunteer at some different events, be able to, to practice providing emergency communication, um, and you know, learning. I, I want to learn about packet. And doggone it, I might have to buy a Windows machine, a Windows laptop, in order to do that. I don't know how much of this, if it all will run on Macs, maybe it will. <clears throat> but, you know, this idea of being able to maintain communication to the outside world, um, even when regular forms of communication are down. The cell phone towers are down. The grid is down. The internet is down. Oh, we can still communicate because we have... You know, solar power backup batteries connected to ham radios, connected to computers that let us, you know, communicate. Of course, that all assumes that, you know, none of this is taken out by an electromagnetic pulse. <laughs> we actually have a physics and uh, math teacher at my former school who has a generator in a Faraday cage that he maintains just, just in case, you know. A scud in a tub is blown up, blown up off the Atlantic coast, and <clears throat> that means that a, a even small nuclear warhead is detonated that puts an electromagnetic pulse in the atmosphere that fries all electronics within, you know, hundreds if not thousands of miles. Who knows? Hopefully we are not going to have any kind of tragedy and, you know, dire emergency that renders the electrical grid inoperable for weeks or months at a time. But the possibility exists that all kinds of things can happen from natural disasters to human initiated disasters. So if you happen to listen to this almost half hour of not ranting, but rambling, uh, I'd love to know about it. You can reach out to me uh, by going to westfriar.com slash contact and I have a contact form you can fill out. I do not share my email address willingly online because I get far too much spam as it is and putting your email address on a web page or just out on social media generally is a is an invitation to spam but you can fill out that web form uh, there's also a phone number actually where you can call or leave leave a message uh, but you know for something like this it's probably great to just have you send a message if you happen to be on Twitter which is my favorite communication platform today you can find me at W Fryer. Um, all of my links to connect are listed on westfriar.com slash after. And there are a ridiculous number of ways to connect with me. Perhaps in the not-too-distant future, I'll be adding my ham radio call sign to that list. So, time will tell. I've got a heck of a lot to learn, but tonight was fun. And it was, it was good. It's, it's good to, to feel the humility of being a beginner. And knowing so little. Uh, I think that's actually a good thing to experience as a teacher uh, and probably just as a human being. So I definitely felt that tonight. But I learned a lot. I learned more than I knew before I came to the meeting. And I look forward to learning more. And 
if you've got suggestions and ideas, I'll put a link to the Facebook group that I've joined. That is a ham radio enthusiast Facebook group. Uh, if you've got other suggestions, you know, reach out. Let me know. Until next time, stay savvy, stay safe, and always remember to tune into the EdTech Situation Room podcast, which is the weekly podcast I do with my friend Jason Neifer, who is in Missoula, Montana. You can find that at edtechsr.com, or you can f- hopefully find and subscribe to that podcast wherever finer podcasts are curated. And just look for the EdTech Situation Room. Take care. Good night.